Evelyn to Philip, February 12th, 1944. Sweetheart mine, had a nice letter from Jack N., and he finally consented to suggest a birthday gift. He wants a khaki shirt, not an OD, but neglected to mention his size. Enclosed is his letter. The part about the gift was written on the back of the envelope. Evidently, the good Lord thought we didn't have enough snow, for today it snowed again. It snowed all morning and called it quits by noon. Ruth borrowed a sled from a neighbor. Adele was dressed in a long sleeve jersey, overalls, fine knit, long sleeve sweater, snowsuit, an outer sweater, knitted cap, mitts, and a scarf, and no less than four large blankets bound about her and placed in the sled. The sled had a back against which we placed Adele and then strapped her to it. The sun shone brightly, the wind was high and mighty, and we ran all over the place, Ruth, Adele, and I, like a couple of six-year-olds, having a hell of a good time. Adele loved it, and I would have kept her out longer than a half hour if the wind had not been so powerful. Adele did something else today, that is, something new. Betty held her hands and danced the while, lifting one foot and then the other, when Adele suddenly did the same. We all got quite a kick out of it, as you can well imagine. February 13th, 1944. As you will notice, I didn't manage to finish this yesterday. It was clear and sunny today, and in spite of the snow-covered grounds, Dot and Snuff showed up as per schedule. Harold, whose picture is enclosed, is really something. Page 2. He's a regular grown-up kid where Adele is still quite babyish. She, however, wasn't in the least timid and shoved him all over the place. Adele got mighty excited when she saw him, and we all enjoyed the show. I've little time to write again, as they just left, and I'll describe the kids more fully later. Please don't let Jack Ann know that I told him your birth date. date. After all, his intentions are good. Adele had me up all night, and I could barely stand up this morning. She had been bothering me entirely too much these past few nights, and I suspected that she was not feeling well. Today her cold broke out, and she was miserable and whimpery most of the day. It's very hard on me when she's ill, and I'm dog-tired, too tired to continue writing. That's my trouble. I'm too tired to write clearly. I know I can do better. The spirit is so willing, baby mine, but the flesh is weak. I know you'll bear with me. I love you so terribly much, Phil. I was interrupted by Adele while writing this after each paragraph, and it's got me thinking of one thing, that I love you, I love you, I love you. More tomorrow's sweetness, your Ev. Philip to Evelyn. Female dated February 12, 1944. My sweet, your V-mail of 29th of January arrived today, and I'm reciprocating in kind. Dottie's V-mail, same date, arrived at the same time. She says she hasn't heard from me since September. That isn't true. I've written at least four times since then, probably more than that. As a matter of fact, I wrote to her just lately and was awaiting her reply. Talk to her, honey, and set her straight, will you? I'll drop her a few lines tomorrow. Still nothing of interest to report. The day was spent just as usual at routine duties. Today, in Yank Magazine, there was a pin-up version of Olivia de Havilland, and there was a disturbingly familiar quality about her legs. This evening, I had a rare case of the blues and couldn't understand why until I happened to note those legs again. I was actually homesick, painfully so, 
for another pair they reminded me of, which I knew so well. It seems so long ago. I find I'm perfectly content and carefree until I start remembering the delectable chippy I left behind. Then I'm so filled with conflicting emotions, with loneliness and longing predominating, that I'm very sorry I remembered. Memories are okay, I guess, when one is in happier circumstances, but under existing conditions, I can only crave the reality those memories once were. Good night, my lovely. You're Phil.